share the screen. It's not sharing. There it is. You probably don't see anything useful there. So uh, what we're covering today is chapter three. And we should finish chapter three, I'm hoping, in chapter four. The quiz on Wednesday is going to cover chapter one, and of course chapter ten, because that goes with chapter one. And remember in chapter ten, it's only the pages. If you have the current edition of the book that's made for Clark College, it's only pages 264 to 272 of chapter 10. Uh, and then also labs 0, 1, and 2. So that's what the quiz is covering. Chapters 1 and 10, the start of chapter 2, and that's essentially uh, the first day of chapter 2, and then labs 0, 1, and 2. Any question about that? All right, so we mentioned what we're going to do, and then on Thursday we should be working on Chapter 4. Actually, we won't finish Chapter 4. We'll start finish that next week. And then later tonight we'll be doing Chapter 4. And I'll wait until I talk to the lab to talk about that. All right, any questions about what we're doing? If not, let's begin. Do I have that out? Doesn't look like I do. Okay, last time we talked about bright field illumination and dark field illumination and how they differ and that most microscopes in a college will be, in fact most microscopes for that matter, will be bright field illumination. Any question about any of that? We had not talked about uh, electron microscopes. Here we're looking at one here. They differ in that they don't use a beam of light. They use a beam of electrons instead. And because the electrons have a smaller wavelength than light, it allows us to magnify uh, objects much smaller than light can magnify. Or you can observe something much smaller than light can observe. Uh, the beam is a focused beam of electromagnetic uh, electrons. Uh, it's focused by lenses, electromagnetic lenses that focus the electrons. Uh, the wavelengths are shorter, and that gives greater resolution and greater magnification. It allows the examination of viruses, which you cannot see with a light microscope, as well as the internal structures of cells. There are different types of electron microscopes, but the main two are the transmission electron microscope and the scanning electron microscope. So here is a picture of the transmission electron microscope and the scanning electron microscope. And besides that, they're different cells, you can notice something different about these. Okay? And that is the transmission electron microscope is two-dimensional, and the scanning electron microscope is three-dimensional. So the scanning electron microscope allows us to view the surface of a cell or an object. And you see it in three dimensions. Uh, you cannot see inside of a cell with scanning electron microscope, unless you were to cut through the cell or do something like that. 
Our transmission electron microscope allows us to see inside a cell, but we can only see one plane through the cell. And here is a transmission electron microscope. I believe it's looking at a chloroplast and the different uh, membranes of a chloroplast. Any question about the difference between a scanning electron microscope and a transmission electron microscope? So if you want to see inside the cell, you have to need to use a transmission electron microscope. But if you want to see the cell in three dimensions, you use a scanning electron microscope. And no, this isn't a cell, that's a crystal. There are other types of electron microscopes, and you're not going to be examined on them. I'm just going to briefly mention them. A scanning, tunneling microscope. It uses a metal probe to scan a specimen. It can get very small. You can see one one hundredth of the diameter of an atom. And here we're using a scanning, tunneling microscope to look at a protein from Escherichia coli. Another electron microscope that you're not going to be quizzed on is the atomic force microscope. It uses a metal and diamond probe inserted into the specimen. It does produce a 3D image of what you're looking at, which we can see here. Uh, this, if you happen to know, Clostridium perfringens has a toxin, and this is the toxin from that clostridium. Any questions about the electron microscope? I'm not hearing anything, so I'm going to move forward. When we view a specimen for a light microscope, we usually stain the cells. Now here we have cells here and cells there. Which cells are easier to view? The cells on the right. The only difference between these cells and those cells is that these cells are scanned. Uh, not scanned, uh, stained. Uh, that's the only difference between these. Cells have very little contrast. They're mostly made of water, and so they do not show up well against the background glass of the slide, or you could say the water and the glass of the slide, the water being what the cells are in. Um, but if you stain the cells, you increase the contrast between the cells and the background of the slide. By the background of these cells, we mean the glass of the slide. That is all staining does, increasing the contrast between the cell and the background. And that makes the cells much easier to view under the microscope. That is the sole purpose of a simple stain. I had to word that appropriately <laughs> to increase the contrast. So with a bright field light microscope, most microbes are colorless and they have little contrast with the slide or the medium. To see them well, you need to stain them. Now you could use a phase contrast microscope and we're not going to even talk about that. That allows you to see cells uh, without staining them. Uh, staining them also allows you to see the cells and all it does is it puts color in the cell and then increases the contrast of the cell to the background. So staining is the coloring of a specimen or the staining of the background of the slide to increase the visibility and the contrast between the cell and its background. Now before you uh, 
stain the cell, you do need to make a bacterial smear. And a bacterial smear is just putting the bacteria on the slide. You do need to do more than just put cells on the slide to make a bacterial smear. You want the smear to be a thin film of solution so that the microbes are on the slide. And you want them to be about one cell thick. Any thicker and your smear isn't very good. So you do make a bacterial smear prior to staining the microbes on the slide. And then after you smear the cells around, you let it air dry, usually, and then you heat fix the bacteria on the slide. The air drying and the heat fixing will attach the cells to the glass of the slide so they are not washed away when you're washing the cells or in staining them. Is that clear? So a bacterial smear is something you make before you stain the cells. And usually we will, after we make the bacterial smear, we will let it air dry and heat fix. If you don't, and then you go and stain the cells, usually staining has a washing step, the washing will wash the bacteria off the slide. Any question about any of that? Another advantage to air drying and heat fixing the cells is that that tends to kill most bacteria. And generally, we would prefer working with a dead bacteria than a live bacteria because you can't get an infection from a dead bacteria. Stains, also called dyes, are salts consisting of a positive and a negative ion. The dye is one of the ions that's colored. And we call that a chromophore. Chromophore, sorry. Uh, if the dye is in the basic portion of the stain, then the dye is a cation or positively charged ion, and we call that a basic dye. The other dyes is where the color is in the negative part of the molecule, and those we call an acidic dye. And the colored part, the chromophore, is in the anion, or the negative part of the molecule. Any question about any of that? All right, if not, let's move forward. Uh, bacteria have a slightly negative charge. So therefore, if you're wanting to stain the cells, you want to use a basic dye. Some examples of basic dyes are crystal violet, methylene blue, safranin, and most of the dyes in microbiology are basic dyes. We do have some acidic dyes and they do not stain the cell because the stain or the dye is negatively charged and the bacteria is negatively charged. So they are repulsed from each other what the acidic dye does, it stains the background of the cell, meaning the glass, and not the cell. Uh, eosine, acid fuchin, and nigrosin are examples of acidic dyes. And they stain the background of the cell, so they are called, besides acidic dyes, they are called negative staining. Uh, that comes from, the term comes from pictures and old cameras that had a negative and you took the negative and you developed the film print from the negative. Of course, modern cameras don't have a negative. 
anymore. Uh, in fact, you might not even see the prints uh, on paper anymore, but uh, um, that's where the term comes from. So it colors the background and does not color the cell. Both of them will stain the cell. Uh, on the left here, we're looking at cell stain by a basic stain. And as you can see, the cells are colored, I don't know, reddish, dark pinkish color. And the background is either not stained or very lightly stained. A negative stain, on the other hand, stains the background of the cell, but not the cell. And in either case, you can easily see the cells. Any question about that? All right. Uh, if we're staining cells with only one stain or one dye, it is a simple stain. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And that is there's three main types of stains. A simple stain, a differential stain, and then special stains. A simple stain is an aqueous or alcohol solution of a single basic dye. Its primary purpose is just to increase the contrast between the background and the cells. All cells will be stained the same color with a simple stain, because there's only one dye. You usually stain the cells for a fixed amount of time, and then that's washed off. It may be dried, and then the cells are looked at under the microscope. So that's a simple stain. You're using only one dye. You may use a mordant. A mordant does not necessarily stain the cell. What it does is it intensifies the stain. We'll talk about a mordant when we're using the gram stain. It may increase the affinity between the stain and the specimen. It may also darken the cell when it is stained. Uh, and then it could coat the specimen many times, which will enhance the ability to see it because instead of having, uh, I don't know, one layer of a stain on it, it's got multiple layers of stain. And an example of a, a mordant used to stain something is the uh, flagella stain. It is uh, uh, multiple layers of the flagella stain allow us to see the flagella in this picture. All right, any question about any of that? So a simple stain uses one stain and everything is stained the cell. A differential stain allows us to see the cells differently. And that is two different species may stain differently with a differential stain. So two different kinds of microbe may stain differently, take on two different colors or something like that. Usually a differential stain uses two or more dyes. But that is not absolutely required. The two most common differential stains in microbiology are the Gram stain, which we'll talk about in this lesson, and an acid fast stain, which you will learn about in a lab. So these are the two most common differential stains, and they allow us to separate two species because they'll stain differently. The Graham stain was actually invented by Hans Christian Graham in 1884. It's named after someone 
So when you write the gram sting, you should put a capital G because Graham is the name of the person who invented the sting. He developed it to uh, distinguish between the patient's cells and a bacterial infection. So he was using it as a differential stain, but he was making it so that the bacteria stained dark and then the patient's cell stained light and he thought that would be useful for looking at a bacterial infection. Microbiologists started using the gram stain and they said, my God, this essentially separates all bacteria into two very large groups. The gram positive cells, which stain purple, and the gram negative cells, which stain pink. Okay, any question about any of that? Uh, if you don't know, the gram stain is no longer used for looking at a bacterial infection in a patient, but it is used all the time in microbiology. Uh, the gram stain procedure is given here as an overview. The first thing you do before doing the gram stain is you got to make a bacterial smear on a glass slide. And you also must air dry the slide and heat fix it because uh, the later steps of the gram stain will wash away the cells if they are not air dried and heat fixed to the slide. You then flood the slide with crystal violet for 60 seconds and that's a stain. We'll talk a little bit more about that. It has a specific name. You then wash with cold water to remove the crystal violet. Shake off the worst of the water. And then flood the slide with iodine. Iodine is not a stain here. It is a mordant. And it is complexing to the crystal violet in the cells, making a larger molecule. You then wash off the iodine with cold water and then uh, remove the water. Flood the uh, slide with acetone and ethanol. This is known as the decolorizing agent and you do this for only a short amount of time, about five seconds. The best thing to do is to hold up the slide and then drop the acetone ethanol on it and you stop dropping the acetone ethanol when you see the color stop running on the slide. You then wash the slide immediately with cold water. You need to wash immediately because even the tr traces of acetone and ethanol can remove the dye, meaning crystal violet and iodine, from cells if you leave it on the cell. So uh, the acetone and ethanol can remove the crystal violet and iodine from the gram-positive cells if the acetone and the ethanol are left on for too long. Any question about any of that? You then wash immediately with water and then flood the slide with safranin. Safranin will stain the cells which are clear. I haven't talked about which cells become clear yet. Uh, so then you can easily see them and the cells stained with crystal violet and iodine will be purple and the cells stained with safranin will be pink. You then wash the slide and then blot it dry and examine it under the microscope. Any questions about the overall procedure? If not, let's go into the procedure in a little more depth. When you stain the cells with crystal violet, all of the cells will take up the crystal violet. So all of them will appear purple, regardless of whether they're gram positive 
four gram negative. Okay. You then wash it with water and then add iodine to the slide. Iodine is a mordant and it will complex with the crystal violet making a larger molecule. We then do the alcohol wash, the decolorizing step, and this could be acetone and ethanol. And that will pull out the crystal violet iodine from the gram negatives and leave it in the gram positives if it is done correctly. Okay? Now, if you don't treat it long enough with acetone ethanol, you will not pull out the crystal violet and iodine from the gram negative cells. So you can do it for too short a time. You can also leave it on for too long a time, in which case the acetone ethanol will pull out crystal violet iodine from the gram positive cells. So this is the tricky step of the gram stain. And it's also the differential step, because after this step, our cells look different. The gram-positive cells will be staining purple. The gram-negative cells will have the dye removed from them, and so they will stain clear at this step. Any question about any of that? All right. You then counter stain with safranin. It's called the counter stain because it's applied after the primary stain, which is the crystal violet. And it will stain the clear cells pink. So that when we look at the cells under the microscope, both the purple cells, the gram positive cells, and the pink cells, the gram negative cells, will be colored and you will be able to see them from the background of the slide. Now that's one problem when you have the decolorizing agent on. If we were to view the slide at this step, the gram-negative cells would be difficult to see because they're uncolored. They have about the same contrast as the background of the slide. Any question about any of that? All right, let's go into the gram stain in much greater detail. We've already talked about you need a bacterial smear on a glass slide. You want it to be very thin, essentially only one layer thick of cells. And that's so that the dye can get to all of the cells, the crystal violet. And then if you had multiple layers and it's gram negative, it will be hard washing out the crystal violet iodine from the gram-negative cells, which are deep down in the layers. So that's why you want a thin bacterial smear, as well as the fact that you want to be able to see the cells and the shape of the cells. And you need a thin bacterial smear in order to do that. You then air dry and heat fix the slide to attach the bacteria to the slide. That is important because in the gram stain, we do wash the cells with water. And if you don't air dry and heat fix them, the water washing will remove the cells from the slide. Any question about any of that? All right. Uh, you then flood the cell with crystal violet and it will stain all the cells purple. Crystal violet will stick to the peptidoglycan in the bacterial cell wall. Crystal violet is considered the primary stain since it colors all cells. Any question about any of that?
So both the gram positive cells and the gram negative cells will be staining purple after you apply the crystal violet. You then do the water wash and generally when you're giving the grams procedure you don't need to say water wash after every step what you just need to say is at the very start of the gram stain or at the very ending that you do a water wash after each step any question about any of that all right you then flood the slide with iodine Iodine is an, an amortant. It increases the affinity of the crystal violet on the specimen. And what iodine does is it's complexing, complexing with the crystal violet. So now we have a larger molecule than this, the crystal violet alone. You flood the iodine and leave it on for 60 seconds. And then you wash it off with the cold water rinse. After the mordant step, meaning the iodine step, uh, both the gram-positive cells and the gram-negative cells are staining purple. And it's very similar to the color with the crystal violet. The only difference is, is that it might be a little less blue, purple, with the iodine step than the crystal violet step. All right, the next step is the tricky one. It's the gram staining procedure where you're using the alcohol wash, and we call that the acid ethanol, the decolorizing agent. If done appropriately, the decolorizing agent will wash crystal violet and iodine out of the gram negative cells, but not out of the gram positive cells. This is considered the differential step in the gram stain because the gram negative cells will appear differently than the gram positive cells. Any question about any of that? You then need to wash the cells immediately because if you leave the acetone ethanol on the cells, it will continue pulling the crystal violet iodine out of the cells. So you need to wash immediately with cold water. When we look at the cells after the decolorizing step, the gram positive cells will stain purple. The gram negative cells will be colorless. All right, any questions about that? We then, excuse me, remove the worst of the water and then stain the slide with safranin. Safranin is a pink dye and stains all bacteria. It's called the counter stain because it has a different color than the primary stain, which is crystal violet. To apply the safranin, you just put it on the slide for one to two minutes and then you wash it off with cold water. After applying the safranin, the color of the gram-positive cells will be purple, and then the color of the gram-negative cells will be pink. Any question about any of that? The purpose of using the safranin, of course, is to make these cells have greater contrast with the background of the slide. Oh, here's a question for you. I stated that safranin is a pink dye and it stains all bacteria. Why is it staining the gram-negative cells pink, but the gram-positive cells are still staining purple? Okay, let's try and get a guess on that. Is the purple is darker? Can you say that again? I think you got it. Because the purple is darker, both stains are there. 
Yeah, both stains are there, but to our herm human eye, we cannot see the pink in the gram-positive cells. To see the pink in the gram-positive cells, we'd have to use an electron microscope. And then if we did, in one cell, we'd see purple dots for where the crystal violet is staining the cell, and we'd see pink dots for where the safranin is staining the cell. So the pink is in the gram-positive cells. It's just that the human eye cannot see the pink because the purple is a more intense color. Okay? So the gram-positive cells are stained with the safranin. It's just they don't pick up the pink color. And that's just a, I don't know, a product of our eyes. We don't see the pink in the purple. And purple is just a more intense color, and so our eye keys in on the purple. All right. After that, you can then blot the slide dry with bibulous paper. And that's paper that looks something like this, if I can get that to show. And you put the slide in there. And so this is my pretend slide. Put the slide in the bibulous paper. And then you press down the bibulous paper. You do not rub the bibulous paper against the cells. Okay? So you don't move it around like this. You know, there you go. What you do is you fold it on the specimen and then just press down. And that gets out the worst of the water, enough water so that the uh, slide can have oil added to it and then somebody can look at it under the microscope even with a 100x uh, objective lens. Okay, so that's how we blot it dry using bibulous paper and I don't think you'll be using bibulous paper uh, anywhere else in this lab other than this lecture and uh, specifically this slide. All right, the basis of the gram stain. The gram positive cells are purple after the procedure. The gram negative cells are pink after the gram stain. Why? What's the basis for the differential staining? Uh, the differences rate, rate or belong to the differences of the cell wall of cells. Some cells have a thick peptidoglycan layer, and the crystal violet iodine complex gets in that layer, and it cannot wash out because of the resistance of the layer to the crystal violet iodine complex. Now, that doesn't mean that it can't ever wash out. It just doesn't easily wash out. The gram-negative cells, on the other hand, have a thin peptidoglycan layer in their cell wall, and it's much too thin for the, uh, to prevent the, the grams. Sorry, I lost it. The gram-negative cells. Ah. talked about that, and I was talking about the uh, gram-negative cells, the crystal violet and the iodine washes out, and uh, that's just because the thin cell wall will not retain the, the crystal violet iodine complex in the cell, 
but a six cell wall will retain, retain the ram's uh, crystal violet and the iodine complex. And it just has to do with the thickness of that cell wall and uh, peptidoglycan, which is the main molecule in the bacterial cell wall. So when we look at the bacteria, we see that there are basically two types of bacteria. Gram-positive cells, which have a very thick peptidoglycan layer. And what it is, is one layer of peptidoglycan on top of another layer on top of another layer. And this picture is only showing you three layers of peptidoglycan, but in reality, it's not three. It's like hundreds, maybe even thousands of layers of peptidoglycan. All right, any question about the gram-positive cells? The gram-negative cells have a cell wall which is really different. And the purple is the peptidoglycan layer. And you'll notice there's a yellow layer uh, on this side of the peptidoglycan and a yellow layer on this side of the peptidoglycan. This layer on top of the peptidoglycan is called the outer membrane of the cell wall. Let me blow that up a little. And with the peptidoglycan layer, this picture is showing you only one layer of peptidoglycan. Please understand that the, that gram-negative cells have much more than one layer. It's uh, several to, I don't know, a dozen or, or more layers of peptidoglycan. But it's thin compared to the gram-positive cells. And it's much too thin to retain the crystal violet iodine when we're applying the, the, uh, the decolorizing agent of the gram stain. You should notice that there are some differences between the gram positive cell and the gram negative cell besides the differences of the thickness of the peptidoglycan. All right, and an important thing to realize with the gram-negative cells is that underneath the cell wall we have a layer which is a lipid bilayer and it's called the cell membrane or the plasma membrane and above the, the peptidoglycan layer of the cell wall we have what's known as the outer membrane of the cell wall. It is a lipid bilayer the same as the cell membrane, but it does have different molecules, at least in this, I don't know, uh, plane of uh, uh, the bilayer. It has different molecules within it. Uh, this molecule, or this layer of the bilayer, is essentially the same as the cell membrane. But this layer is different in the outer membrane, and that's because it contains these blue molecules, which are a lipopolysaccharide, meaning they have lipid A shown for the knob, and then an O polysaccharide attached to the lipid A, and that's that hair-like structure going outside the cell. A lipid A is important because it is an endotoxin. We'll talk about toxins three times in this lab, and this is the first time we'll talk about it. And that is all gram-negative cells, if they have a cell wall, will have an endotoxin in them, and that endotoxin is lipid A. And the host is going to have to deal with that endotoxin. All right, any question about any of that? Come on. It's not moving. 
So the crystal violet iodine forms a complex in all cells, both the gram positive and the gram negative. But the crystal violet iodine complex will be washed out in the decolorizing step of the gram stain. So the gram-negative cells, the crystal violet iodine washes out of the thin peptidoglycan layer. And it's just because the peptidoglycan layer is too thin to retain the crystal violet iodine. The lipopolysaccharide layer of the outer membrane is disrupted during the alcohol wash. And cells will therefore be colorless after the uh, acetone alcohol wash for the gram-negative cells. I should state they're colorless for the gram-negative cells. They still are going to be purple for the gram-positive cells because the crystal violet iodine is not going to wash out of that very thick peptidoglycan layer in the gram-positive cells. So the gram-positive cells will stain purple from the crystal violet. The gram-negative cells at this step are going to be clear because we haven't applied the counter stain yet. Once you apply the counter stain, the gram-negative cells will stain pink. And this is showing you a preparation of cells that has been stained with the gram stain. And here you can see the gram-positive rod. Over here, gram-positive cocci. Uh, over here, a gram-negative spirilla, a gram-negative um, bacteria of interior bacteriaceae. All right, so the point is with the gram stain, you can see differences between cells, a gram-positive and a gram-negative over here that you would not be able to see with a light microscope and a simple stain. Now in the gram stain, there's something I wanted to talk about. Ah, I seem to have lost it. I will state with the archaea, they don't have peptidoglycan for the crystal violet iodine to get into, but the archaea have two basic types of cells. They have those which stain gram positive with the gram stain, and those which stain gram negative with the gram stain. The reason for this is that with the archaea, the cells which have a very thick cell, uh, very thick cell wall will stain gram positive for the archaea. And then if the cells have a very narrow cell wall, uh, the gram stain, the crystal violet iodine part of it, will bind to the host patients. All right, any question about any of this? Now, I have discussed the gram stain in simple terms, but sometimes when you use the gram stain, you'll get precipitates of the stain ending up on your slide. So this blob here and this blob here was not on this slide until the student put the crystal violet down on the cells. And this glob came out of the crystal violet. Uh, it could be a pathogen or a bacterial infection, whatever, 
but it's hard to say in this slide. It could also be a harmless cell bacteria that's gotten into you. So the immune system cannot really tell, at least initially, once it has uh, responded and you build up immunity to a disease, it tends that the, uh, the really healthy patients can be asymptomatic and they will stain with the gram stain, but the patient will have no symptoms. Uh, and then the other case is if the patient's health is not good and then we, they get an infection, the uh, cells can do damage to the patient and so we have to treat them. But the point is we can do the gram stain on both the gram positive and the gram negative cells and the difference for both the archaea and the bacteria relates to the thickness of the cell wall. If the cell wall is thick, the cells will be scored gram-positively in gram-positive. And if the cell wall is thin, the cells will be scored gram-negatively. All right, any question about any of that? When you have problems on a slide, for example, this region here, that region there, and that region there, and you're trying to determine what your cells are under the gram stain, you should determine your cells from a good region of the slide. One that doesn't have crystals in it, one that is uniformly pink or purple, and one that is dilute so that you can see the shape of the cells. If you had too many cells on a slide, I don't have a picture of that, uh, it'll be very difficult determining the shape. It may not be positive. And then also, if you have too many cells on the slide, you will interfere with the gram stain. Okay? So you want to look at the slide where the cells appear to be good for determining the gram stain. If you were to look at the cells around here, it's not showing, in this picture, but usually around the crystal violet, actually it's showing for those cells there, usually around where there's a crystal of crystal violet, uh, the cells will pull up more crystal violet than normal. And these cells can look gram positive because they're getting the crystal violet directly from this crystal. Whereas if we look out further, the cells are not going to be gram-positive, they look gram-negative. Any question about that? Oops, that's too... Uh... The gram stain is tricky, and to do it well, you must only use freshly grown cells. If you don't use freshly grown cells, the gram stain may not work correctly. Particularly, some cells will stain gram-negatively when they should be staining gram-positively. So to do the gram stain, you use freshly grown cells. What's freshly grown cells? The cells cannot be more than two days old. Some stains do not stain well with the gram stain. This is particularly true of the mycobacteria. And these we call either non-staining or weakly staining cells. Usually, if you stain the mycobacterium, you can get them to stain, and they will stain gram-positively because the crystal violet is not washed off in the colorizing step. You could also argue the cell wall is thick. Anyways, the results are not as clear 
cut as you would hope they would be and that will become evident to you when you're working on your unknown project that you might be pulling your hair out trying to figure out what's going on in the gram stain. I think I mentioned that usually where you have a crystal violet the dye can come out of this crystal and then color the cells around the crystal and they will be staining dark when in fact they should be staining light, meaning a gram-negative cell. All right, any question about any of that? If there's no questions, let me go further and state that the structure of the gram-positive and gram-negative cells does more than just affect the staining of the cells. It's also related how the cells respond to many antibiotics. Gram-positive bacteria, for example, tend to be killed easily by penicillin G, as well as the cephalosporin and many detergents. Why? It's because the crystal violet can get into the cells and stain them and so the cells will look purple. On the other hand, the gram-negative cells will resist these antibiotics, specifically penicillin G, and the reason why is penicillin G needs to get inside the cell wall to damage the peptidoglycan, to damage the cell wall, and then the penicillin G, because it damaged the cell wall, it kills the cell. And that's how penicillin G works. The penicillin G cannot get in the negative, gram-negative bacteria. And the reason is, is that they cannot get through the outer membrane of the cell wall. They can't get through the outer membrane. That means they, the crystal violet cannot get, I mean the, the uh, penicillin G cannot get through the outer membrane. It cannot get through to the peptidoglycan and then damage the peptidoglycan. All right, any question about any of that? So the thick cell walls will stay in gram positive. They will be sensitive to penicillin G, as well as cephalosporin and mini detergent. The gram negative cells are a thinner cell wall. They'll stain pink in the gram stain. And these cells are resistant to many antimicrobials, including penicillin G, and the problem is, is that penicillin G cannot get through the outer membrane of the uh, cell wall of a gram-negative cell. All right, any question about any of that? If not, let me talk briefly about uh, a capsule stain. A capsule stain is used to stain capsules on cells. And so the dark purple is the caps that is the bacteria. And then the white area around the dark purple, that's the capsule. The capsule is not staining. And then the background of the cell is stained light purple. And that allows us to see the capsule with the capsule stain. Another capsule stain is a very simple one. And you just add India ink to the cells. India ink primarily will stain the background of the slide, very dark. But it does stain the cells slightly. And that's why they're staining a light shade of gray here. And then the capsule will not stain with the India ink. 
and so it'll provide a clear halo around the cell that made the capsule. The reason why I wanted to talk about the uh, capsule stain, you're not going to be tested on it, but you may need the capsule stain in your unknown report. So that's why I wanted to talk about it. All right, are there any questions? When are you going to be assigning the unknown? When am I going to be assigning it? Is that what you asked? Yes. Okay. It's here in the uh, lab, and it looks like we're going to be talking about the unknown project this Thursday. And then we'll okay. start the unknown project on Tuesday after that. So I was going to mention this in the lab, but you need to read about the unknown project. So when I talk about it, it will be easy to discuss. All right, any question about any of that? If not, that's it for chapter three. And it's six o'clock. I think I'm going to stop here. And then I will start chapter four at 630. Any questions? I just had one more question. Uh -huh. When are you going to be approving the um, infectious diseases that we requested? Oh, yes. I got a number of those over the weekend and I have not responded. So I hope to do that uh, shortly. But I have that. I just haven't gotten back to you. And uh, what can I say? Sorry, real life has been very difficult lately, and I just haven't had time to get back to get back to you on that. But I will, and I hope to do that. If you remind me after the lab, I'll try and get it done tonight. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. I'll see you at six thirty.